Hello and welcome back to Get Up and Game. My name is Josh and in this video I'm going to be doing an overview of the recently announced Age of Apocalypse campaign expansion. Now I know this is coming pretty late as the article came out well over a week ago at this point, but I'm still on my just had a baby break so apologies for taking so long. And I'm still technically on the break, but I did need to quickly slip back into content creator mode to talk about this because it's really exciting. Also, I haven't watched anyone else's previews, so apologies if I just say the same stuff everyone else said. But let's get into it. Now, right off the bat, this box has a lot to live up to, in my opinion. Not only is it the finale of the Mutant Trilogy, not only is it Flippin' Apocalypse, who's one of the bigger Marvel villains and a fan favorite, but it's coming on the heels of what I consider a masterpiece in Next Evolution. A phenomenal box that not only contained an addictively fun campaign and two great heroes, but elevated the entire Marvel Champions experience with the Superpower mods, the Hope Summers mod, and the player side schemes. So yeah, a lot riding on this. But from what we've seen so far, it seems set to deliver. Now let's start out by talking about the villains that have been revealed so far. First off, we have Unus, also known as Unus the Untouchable. Now you can be forgiven if you have no idea who this guy is. He's actually one of the first people the X-Men ever went up against way back in the early days of the comics, but he isn't used very often. Also, if his name looks familiar, he's probably related to the Unushione minion from the Acolyte set, since they have the same last name. But weirdly, we don't know for sure, according to Wikipedia. His scenario appears to revolve around the gene pool permanent side scheme that reads, Forced Response. After an ally is defeated by anything other than consequential damage, place three threat here. And it starts with four threat. So basically, every time you chump block or let your allies get killed, threat gets added to this. And the reason we care about that is Unus gets stronger depending on how much threat is on the gene pool side scheme. He can get retaliate, stalwart, and even an amplify icon if you don't keep it under control. So that's pretty interesting. You could choose to ignore it and just put up with Unus being worse, or you can take the time to manage it and keep Unus on the easier side. The main scheme goes up to 11 per player and also adds one threat to gene pool every turn. So even if you aren't chump blocking, you'll still have to deal with it to some degree. And I always appreciate a main scheme that goes up really high like this. It makes it easier for solo heroes to flip down from time to time. I find those are often the scenarios I return to over and over. We also see here an attachment that goes on Unus, the Prelate Sidearm. Get used to the word Prelate, as it gets used a lot in this set, apparently. Basically, it's a word for a high-ranking apocalypse goon. The sidearm gives Unus plus one attack and adds an additional threat to gene pool if Unus defeats an ally. I think you can safely assume there will be a lot of effects that are adding threat to that side scheme in this set. One thing that's interesting about it though is gene pool isn't part of the Unus encounter set and is instead a part of a separate modular called the infinites. We also see here a minion from that set called an infinite soldier with guard and similar to Unus gets worse based on the amount of threat on gene pool. If you don't have things under control, this thing could have Surge, Quick Strike, and 6 hit points with Guard. That's nasty. Now I said I was hoping to see some things emerge from this box that would change the game overall, and this is the first. This being a separate mod set means you can add a major penalty for chump blocking into any encounter. Yes, we do have the Zero Tolerance modular that's kind of similar, but this is even better as Gene Pool has setup and is always permanent. So when you include this with your game, it'll always be a problem. Very cool way to remove the common solution for a lot of scenarios, or at the very least make it a more interesting decision whether or not to chump block. And Unus looks like a good start to the box. Probably not too tough, as long as you can thwart halfway decently. And even if not, you can just deal with the consequences in other ways, so it's cool that you have some options. The second scenario appears to be the Four Horsemen. Right off the bat, I want to say I'm so glad this is a multi-villain scenario and that the box wasn't just four different Horsemen scenarios and then Apocalypse. These villains are cool and all, but there are way too many good X-Men villains to take up four spots with these guys. Also, it appears we just get one multi-villain fight in every box now, which is pretty cool. This one looks to be modeled after the Wrecking Crew, as opposed to the one-at-a-time model we've gotten more recently with Mansion Attack and Morlock Siege. And I'm all for a new take on an old, uh, classic, shall we say? This one looks way nastier than the Wrecking Crew, though, as the gimmick here appears to be that each villain has a brutal effect after it attacks you. And unlike the Sinister Six, they don't have to damage you to trigger their ability. So if they activate, you're going to be taking the effect. Also, they all stay active until they're all defeated, though if their hit points are reduced to zero, then their force response is turned off at least. 
So what are these brutal effects? Well, if War attacks you and he has at least one hit point, you have to discard an upgrade or support. That's awful. Just a casual caught off guard every time he attacks. We don't yet know how the active counter gets moved around in this one yet, but if possible, make sure it never lands on this guy. Or just reduce him to zero health as quick as you can. Famine makes you discard the top 10 cards of your deck when she attacks. Not as bad as War, but not great. Gonna get you to another encounter card real quick. Though it might hit you when you only have a few cards left, or you might even be happy to reshuffle in order to get some good cards back. Pestilence blanks your text box for the round, so depending on who you're playing, that might not be too bad, or it might be horrendous. Domino becomes a lot less fun to play for the turn, but Spectrum will be unaffected. More often than not, though, it will be pretty bad. And Death will hit you and every character you control for one, making mincemeat out of your allies. At least it's a response and not an interrupt, though, so it won't kill a potential chump blocker. They all only have 9 hit points per player and relatively low stats on stage 1 anyways, but it's a good thing since they also all have a treachery level forced response after every attack. Stuns will be very welcome here. Now we've seen a couple attachments for the horsemen that boost their stats and make it so that even if you have reduced them to 0 hit points, they'll still trigger their forced effect. And in order to get rid of them, you have to suffer that forced response yet again, so that's not very nice. Interestingly, the golden horse gives the attached horseman Ariel, while Death already has Ariel, so his Metal Wings gives him Retaliate instead. It's cool that the Horseman of Death appears to be a little more the focus than the other three. The only other card we've seen so far for the Four Horsemen scenario is a treachery called Rough Riders, and it reads, When revealed, resolve the forced response on the active villain as if it has at least one hit point and attacked you. Move the active counter to the next villain and resolve its forced response the same way. Yikes. So you could potentially be losing an upgrade or support and the top 10 cards of your deck, for example. On top of the fact that you probably already suffered one of these force responses when you just got attacked. It is a cool way to keep stuns from blocking these villains' abilities. And by cool, I mean terrible. No word on what the mod sets for this one might look like, but overall, I think this might be our toughest multi-villain fight yet. Wrecking Crew is pretty easy to manage. Tower Defense might be the easiest scenario in the whole game. And I've often said the Sinister Six could stand to be a little tougher. This looks pretty rough. But more than likely, it'll have nothing on the next scenario. The main man himself, Apocalypse. Yes, they're pulling a Thanos on us again, where the face on the box isn't the final villain. Let's hope this one doesn't end with a Loki, though. Bleh. The Mad Titan Shadow comparisons don't stop there, though, because this scenario looks an awful lot like the Hella scenario, and I'm here for it. But we'll get to that in a second. First, taking a look at Apocalypse Stage 1, he has one scheme, two attack, and eight hit points per player, so not very scary at all, to be honest. He does have toughness, and his main deal is that when the main scheme gets completed, instead of losing the game, you change Apocalypse up to his next stage. And the main scheme is directly tied to which stage Apocalypse is on, as the numeral and his printed hit point value determines the threat threshold. So when he's in Stage 1, the main scheme will pop at 8 threat per player, and then 9, and then 10, and then 11, as Apocalypse advances in stages. The main scheme also tells us that if Apocalypse would be defeated, instead, he heals back up, you get to discard all his attachments, and remove threat from the scheme equal to that numeral of his starting hit points. So, similar to Hela, you can't defeat him by reducing his hit points, but at least you get to remove some threat and discard any attachments on him. Right away, I'm wondering how hard it's going to be to keep that main scheme from advancing, since it's how Apocalypse gets to his higher forms. Because there's plenty of scenarios where the main only goes up to 8 or 9 or whatever, and you just lose the game, and we're able to keep those under control. So I suspect there's going to be a lot of extra threat being thrown at the main, so it gets to advance once in a while. Otherwise, it's going to be pretty easy to keep Apoc on his stage 1. Here we see why you can tell this is another take on the Hella scenario. There are these three side schemes, and presumably side 1A setup will have you putting the first one into play right from the start. Heart of the Empire is the first one, and it reads, Threat cannot be removed from this scheme while a prelate minion is in play. And then when defeated, the first player reveals a random set-aside prelate minion, deal each other player an encounter card, and then flip this card over. This is basically the equivalent of the first side scheme that starts in play with Hela, but instead of Garm standing between you and advancing deeper into Hela's domain, we'll be facing random prelate minions. We don't get to see any of these in the article, but we can safely assume they're pretty beefy especially when we see that the side schemes have very little threat on them and don't scale per player. Either the danger here is meant to come from the prelate minions as opposed to the side schemes, or the designers know we're going to have our hands full trying to keep the main under control, so they didn't want to make us remove too much threat from the side schemes. 
After the Heart of the Empire is defeated, we move on to the Towering Citadel, and then from there, the Tyrant's Throne, each time putting in another random prelate minion and needing to defeat that minion before we can remove threat from the side scheme. One difference between this one and Hela is her side schemes get increasingly worse icons on them, going from acceleration to amplify to hazard. Here we see it simply goes from one acceleration icon to two and then three. This of course makes sense since Apocalypse is trying to complete a scheme over and over in order to advance stages and get stronger. Once the Tyrant's Throne is defeated, instead of rescuing Odin, we'll be placing the no longer worthy attachment on Apocalypse. This is what will make him vulnerable to defeat. It starts out by telling us to attach to Apocalypse and heal 5 hit points per player from him. He cannot take damage while a Prelate minion is in play. Again, similar to Hela, Apocalypse has been getting more health all game as he advances his stages, and here he's going to get to heal 5 per player before you move on to the final part of the fight. That way you won't be able to leave him on the verge of death before flipping that last scheme and then easily finish him off. And similar to the side schemes, he can't be dealt with unless there are no Prelate minions in play. I think the difficulty of this scenario seems largely dependent on how hard those guys are going to be to kill. No Longer Worthy also tells us to ignore the forced interrupt on the main scheme, and then forced interrupt when Apocalypse is defeated, the players win the game. So once this is out, we no longer heal Apocalypse and remove threat when he's reduced to zero hit points, we'll simply win. Now Hela is one of my favorite scenarios in the game as I love the sense of progression as you move through. So I am very excited for this one, and even though it's Apocalypse, so it should be really hard, I'm hoping it's not too bad so I don't feel put off from wanting to play it a lot, kind of like I do with some of the other really difficult villains. They haven't told us what the 4th and 5th scenarios are officially, but there is an image of the back of the box floating around online so we know who one of them is, and there's a pretty common theory for who the 5th could be, and I agree with it. I won't spoil it for you here if you want to be surprised, but the info is out there if you want to know. Going back to what I was saying about hoping for bigger overall additions to the game, they revealed two more very interesting elements of the campaign expansion. The first one is a new side mission mechanism. We actually don't know exactly how these work, but we can take a look at the cards they showed us and we can at least begin to put together what this might look like. First, we'll look at a basic support called Mission Team that probably starts in play when you're playing with missions. It reads, Mission Team cannot be discarded and the first player gains control of it. And then as an action, you can exhaust mission team and choose one. Either reduce the cost of the next ally played to the mission by two, or make a mission attempt. So we're playing allies to missions and we're making mission attempts, which makes it sound like there's some kind of randomness to the missions. If we're making an attempt, then it must be possible to fail. Also, a free support that lets you play an ally for two less is awesome. So let's look at the mission that is revealed in the article. It's in the form of a side scheme with five threat per player and is called Evacuate Survivors. It's double-sided and the first side reads, Force Response, after you resolve a mission attempt, place one attempt counter here and deal one damage to each ally at the mission. If there are four attempt counters here, remove mission team from the game and flip this card over. So we can glean from this that we only get four attempts to remove all the threat from the side scheme. And each time we try, all the allies at the mission take a damage, which sounds brutal. We know from the article that you play allies to the mission itself, and they don't count against your ally limit. So it sounds like there's some kind of set-aside mission area. And we also know that only the allies at the mission can thwart it. So you absolutely have to be playing allies to this thing in order to clear it. And it sounds like you'll have to do it a lot if they're taking extra damage just for attempting to thwart it. But what we don't see is any penalty for not defeating it. The article makes it sound like these are grave threats that must be dealt with, so presumably there's a penalty in the campaign, but what about outside of the campaign? Not sure if there's a penalty or you're just missing out on a reward. Because it goes on to say, when defeated, shuffle each player card at the mission into its owner's deck. Flip mission team and this card over. So if you do manage to succeed at your attempts, however that works, you get to shuffle your cards back into your deck and flip mission team over. And if we look at the finished side of Mission Team, it reads, Action, Exhaust Mission Team, Choose a Player to Draw a Card. So the table gets a free card draw every turn. Nothing wrong with that. Now let's look at the other side of Evacuate Survivors. Force Response, after you flip to this side, remove each card in the mission area from the game and do the following. If the mission was not defeated, deal each player a face-down encounter card. But if the mission was defeated, each player searches your deck and discard pile for one card and adds it to their hand. So first off, if you manage to defeat the mission the way you're supposed to, you'll have shuffled all your cards back into your deck already. 
But if you fail the mission by gaining four attempt counters, you'll be removing each card in the mission area from the game. So that's not good. And then if you didn't defeat it properly, you're getting an extra encounter card. But if you did, you get to search for a card and add it to your hand. So there's definitely some significant interactions coming from these things, and it seems really cool. We also have one more card that we can look at as part of all this mission stuff. Apparently there are also overseers that will be messing with us while trying to complete missions, and they've shown us the Sugar Man, who reads, uh, he has victory five, cannot take damage while another minion is at the mission, and then as a mission response, after you discard cards, heal three damage from Sugar Man for each physical resource discarded. He has five hit points per player, but he has dashes for his scheme and attack, so not sure exactly how he's hindering us. But we can glean another clue about how missions work from his response. First of all, it's a mission response, which I assume triggers after you do a mission attempt. And then it says, after you discard cards, he might heal some. So it seems like a mission attempt probably involves us having to discard cards, either from our hand or maybe our decks. And then I'm guessing maybe the number of cards we discard will help determine the success or failure of the mission. This reminds me very much of the various tests you would have to do in the Lord of the Rings LCG, and those were usually pretty interesting, so I have high hopes for this mechanism. Now the article only speaks about the side mission mechanism as it pertains to the campaign, but if we look at the cards, Evacuate Survivors is part of the Mission Modular Encounter set, Mission Team is Basic as well as Campaign, and Sugar Man is part of the Overseer mod set. So I'm assuming and hoping that you really will be able to add missions to any scenario outside of the Age of Apocalypse campaign, but I don't think we know that for sure. One thing you definitely will be able to add to your games outside of the AOA campaign is the new Standard 3 set. I am so thrilled about this. Not necessarily because of what we've seen here, but just the idea of it and what it could mean for the future. But first, let's take a look at what Standard 3 has in store for us. The whole theme of it revolves around your nemesis. If you're the type of player who feels like you never see Shadow of the Past and so rarely gets to interact with your nemesis sets, then this is going to be right up your alley. This set is meant to be used in place of Standard 1 or 2, and it's about the same difficulty of Standard 1, and has the permanent environment pursued by the past that will start the game in play and reads, Force Response, after you place a pursuit counter here, if the number of counters here is at least three more than the number of players, remove each counter here. If your nemesis minion is in play, it activates against you. Otherwise, flip this card over. So we need to read the other side to get the full picture. Force response, after you flip to this side, find your nemesis minion and reveal it. Search the set aside area for your nemesis side scheme and reveal it. Shuffle your remaining set aside nemesis set into the encounter deck. Flip this card over. So essentially you're going to be putting pursuit counters in the environment and once it gets to enough, you get a free shadow of the past. Or if your nemesis is still sat in front of any player, they will activate against you. And they showed us a few other of the cards that go along with it and they are essentially modified versions of advance, assault, and gang up, only they add pursuit counters to the environment. One cool element of this though is that if they do bring out your nemesis, then they don't trigger their other effect. So like with dark designs, it adds a pursuit counter and then if that's the last one, you'll get your nemesis. The counters will be removed and nothing else happens. But if you don't end up with your nemesis, then the villain schemes and the others work similarly. So it's adding a consistency to the nemesis element of the game. You're pretty much definitely going to see it every game instead of very randomly once in a while. And it gives you something new to think about. Instead of worrying about advance coming out, if there's three counters on Pursued by the Past in solo, then you know the villain definitely won't be scheming, but you will be getting your nemesis. So it changes the game to a pretty decent degree. Now, for me personally, I'm not one of those players who's asking for more ways to interact with the Nemesis sets. I think they range from no big deal to incredibly annoying, and I'm perfectly happy to draw Shadow of the Past never. So I wouldn't say I'm over the moon about Standard 3 itself. I'll play with it once in a while just to shake things up. But what I am excited for is the potential of other themed Standard sets. There is a ton of space here to add variety, and I'm always all about that. I definitely like this better than just getting an even harder version of Standard 2, though. No thank you. Okay, it's finally time to talk about what I'm always the most excited for, the heroes. Who thought we were getting...